Hello everybody. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I will not see you, but <laughs> again, nice to meet you. Um, so I'm Remy Forax from the Paris East uh, University, which is uh, in the middle between Paris and uh, Euro Disney, uh, Disneyland Paris. And uh, today we will talk about uh, how trash, um, how to clear your mind about how to implement a design pattern and uh, join me and use lambdas everywhere. Uh, so I'm a feather of free. <laughs> Sometimes it's my uh, main job. Uh, so uh, I'm a teacher at uh, the university and I'm expert for several uh, GSR, so I'm one, the, one of the father of uh, Invoke Dynamic. I don't know if you know, it's the bytecode that nobody knows, which was uh, uh, introduced in Java 7. Um, so I'm, I was also an expert for the Lambda uh, group. So if you found, find that the Lambda is something great, you can cheer me and for all the other problems, uh, please contact the Brian Goetz. And currently, I'm a, I am an expert for the Java module things for uh, Jigsaw. Basically, my role for Jigsaw is just to have the things done. And I'm also an open source developer. Basically, it's uh, I became uh, an expert because I wanted to change Java. That was basically the idea. Uh, so I'm I'm a committer so on some uh, um, workspace in OpenJDK. I am a developer of ASM, which is a tool that generates bytecodes. Uh, Last year, I have written uh, a kind of uh, JavaScript runtime written in JavaScript that run on the GVM and things like this. So uh, this is the slide that said that I will tell only lies, damn lies, and something very specific to this talk I will not show you any wildcards. Basically, all the signatures that you will see on the slide are false. You have to add the wildcards. Um, but it, uh, I can't write wildcards because uh, it doesn't fit on the slide. Uh, how many people know how uh, lambdas works? <laughs> how many people don't know <laughs> how lambdas works? One hand, two, three, oh no, ten, something like this. Okay, just uh, uh, a quick uh, remember uh, on how it works. Um, basically, the idea is uh, you should not care about lambdas. Lambdas is not the concept which is important. The important concept is functional interface. Um, the, the idea of Java 8 is uh, we want to introduce a function type in the language, but instead of having a specific syntax for function type, um, we reuse uh, the, the mechanism of interface and say, if I have an interface with only one abstract method, I will use it to type a uh, function. So basically, if I have an interface like this, um, an interface bin up with a method applied that take two ins and return an ins, um, what we have 
done in uh, in the expert group of Java is just uh, uh, in the expert groups of Lambda is just teach the compiler that uh, this can represent a function that takes two ints and return an int. This is a uh, this is a function type. If I want to pass a function that take two ints and return an int, I will be able to use binop to represent that type. So a function, a functional interface, it's just an interface with one abstract method and you can use it to type um, a function. Then you have a special syntax uh, if you want to create anonymous function. Basically, an anonymous uh, method with no class. So we have a special syntax, like uh, at the bottom of the, of the slide, which is the, lo the lambda syntax. And um, you, you can define uh, um, basically a code and you, uh, because the code is uh, simple, uh, you don't want to name it. That's basically the ID. Um, the code is more important than the name the that you can find for it. So um, the, the ID is, you have a nice syntax. Uh, you can um, remark something on the syntax. You don't have to declare the type of X. And y, x and y are uh, parameters here, and you don't have to declare the type of them because binop already uh, carry the type, because binop is defined as an interface with one method that takes two int. We know that x and y here will be ints. So um, the syntax is uh, nice and compact because the compiler is able to take the type from binop, extract it, see it as, um, as a function type. Basically, defining the interface binop is conceptually equivalent to having a type def that say binop is something that takes two int and return an int. And so I can use it to um, type uh, viable like add or mul. So we have a way to uh, reuse interface to type uh, function and we have a nice syntax to define anonymous function. Basically a lambda is a kind of anonymous function. Um, uh, then we have a special package in Java 8 named javautil.function and this package defines um, the, the common um, function type that you use. Uh, not all the interfaces are in Java util function. Uh, runnable uh, is Java long runnable. A uh, Java long runnable have one method run, it takes nothing and return nothing. So it can be used to type a function that take nothing and return void. Um, these uh, interfaces um, are used as a kind of common language. Basically, it's the interfaces you should know if you want to develop in Java 8. Um, If you want to modelize uh, things like um, a function that takes no parameter and return an object, you will use a supplier. And um, because uh, in Java we fucked up with generics, <laughs> if you want to return an int, you need a special um, uh, interface, which is int supplier. Everybody knows that you can't put int in a, in a generics, 
you can't say it's a supplier of int. Uh, I mean, it will change in 10, but currently you can't do that. So we have a bunch of uh, uh, interfaces that we use, um, and I will use in, in the next slides uh, to, um, uh, to type functions that, by example, take an int and return void. It will be an int consumer and, and so on. So we have the concept of uh, functional interface. We have lambdas, uh, which we ca you can define um, expression that you will see as um, uh, as a value. And the next thing you have is what we call method reference, which is uh, if the method already exists, if you have already a code. Uh, by example, uh, integer dot sum, which is a, a static method in Java long integer. You can reference this static method and say, I want to see it as a bin up, as a function that takes two int and return an int. You can do exactly the same things on methods that are uh, instance method, like the method length in string. Um, if you say string colon colon length, in that case, you take an instance method and you see it as a function. Because it's an instance method, it means that the corresponding function will take a string and return an int. Is it okay for everybody? It's a method, but if you want to see it as a function, you have to prepend the type of the class. And you can do something fun, really, really fun, which is if you have a value like uh, hello here, you can use colon colon directly on a value, directly on an instance of a class. And um, in that case, the, um, the, the method length will be bound to the value hello, which means that if you call the supplier here, it will call length on hello every time you call your supplier. So that's all. If you know this, you know everything you need to know. So, just um, I will show you some example on how we can use it, and I will use the G shell, which is the shell that will be included in in nine. So we can start. No, we can't. Okay, so it's basically a, ch a shell. You write um, Java things in it, and it works if you say something like this. So it it's pretty cool, and it's really nice if you want to explore some API on things like this. Um, I mean, it will it will not change the way you uh, program if you are uh, already a, a senior developer, but uh, I mean, if you are a kid or something, or if you want to uh, uh, test an API that you don't know, it's really, really pretty cool. So we can define an interface pin up and say it will return an int and take two ints, and okay, I have new, a new interface bin up, and I can use it uh, 
to do things like this. Uh, I will um, implement the interface with a function that takes two parameters and do the sum of the two parameters. Which means that in Java 8, you have another way to implement an interface. If this interface has only one method, you can implement it using a lambda. Which means that now you have to change all your code and remove all your classes and replace it with lambdas. Oh, sorry, just kidding. And because it's an interface, you can call it uh, using apply here, because this is the name of the, of the method of the interface. And if you do things like this, yeah, 1 plus 2 is equals to 3. Uh, obviously, you can change things. And in that case, it will be weird, but it will return minus 1. Um, so it's a new way to create, you, you can see it as a new way to create an, an implementation of an interface if the interface is reduced to one abstract method. So a functional interface is an interface that represents uh, a function. Uh, obviously, uh, once we have this, uh, we can uh, implement um, the idea is um, y you can implement things that will take uh, a functional interface as parameter. And so you will be able to parameterize your code with a function. That's basically the idea. So Let's say I have a list of string, which is equals to as list of hello devox. Oh. Okay, and on my list, I can call for each. For each is a new a method that was added in 8, and for each, take a function that will be called for every element. So I will send a function which for each element will just print the elements. Whoa. So that's basically the idea. The idea is just uh, y you can write a code and you can parameterize it with a function. And the function will be executed in that case once uh, for each element. If we decompose it, we have two phases. The first one is uh, technically, a for each take a consumer here, by example, a consumer of object, which is my lambda. Oh. So I see my lambda as a consumer of object and then I call for each with this consumer. And if I write thing, things in that way, the compiler is um, smart enough to take the look of what for each take as parameter, see that this is a consumer, see that a consumer is something that takes an object and returns void, and so the element here will be the element uh, 
uh, of the list. Type uh, here as a string because it's a list of string. Uh, if you want, you can um, provide the type like this, but you don't have to. You can just let the compiler do what he knows. Um, perhaps another uh, example. I have an int stream, which is basically um, a stream of values. And I have a method range in it, which works really like range in Python. Um, it will uh, uh, generate the uh, ints from 0 to 10. And on it, I can do things like reduce and reuse my example if I want to sum the value. Ah, it's the wrong reduce. OK, so the sum of 0 to 9, it's 45. So here, when I use reduce, I will explain how I want to uh, group uh, values together. So if I want to do things like this, if I want to implement factorial, I will implement it like this. No? Oh, yes. If I have a zero here, it's not very fun. The thing which is important is, is that reduce is implemented only once and take a function as parameter. Okay, so, so you can, if you want, write a, a kind of generic code that will be parameterized by a function taken as parameter. That's basically the idea uh, of the thing. As I said, there is another syntax. If you want to reuse, um, you have a method sum in integer, which is able to do the sum between to ins, so I can use it and say here, I will take the static method and see it as an object that implement uh, my binary operation. And the syntax for this is colon colon. So basically it take a static method and see it as an object that implement an interface that take two ints and return an int. Um, perhaps just a little more complex. Um, you can write things if I... Here there is a way uh, to write this using a colon colon which is that way. <laughs> it's less fun, perhaps. <laughs> it's just uh, print ln. It's something on a print stream. If, if you want to decompose it in two, you have something like this. It's just system dot out. OK, and on out, you can do so. Basically, here, uh, println, if you uh, see it as a method, you apply it on the print stream and send one parameter, which is the object you want to print. But if you see it as a function, it's a function that takes two parameters, the print stream and the string. Um, if you, I want to send it to forage, 
I have to use only a function that take one parameter. So if I write, if I want to see it as a consumer string, basically I can write it like this, which is a consumer string, take a string and return void. And I can see println, which is a function that take two parameters. Remember, println is something that take a print stream and a string. And I will say, for the first parameter, I want that my function will uh, the function will always always take system dot out as first parameter. So instead of seeing my function with two parameters, I see my function as a function that take one parameter because the first one will be always system dot out. This is exactly uh, what I'm doing when I, when I write this. Okay, for everybody, we can start to talk about design patterns. Um. Okay. So, the Gamma book, or the Gang of Four book. Uh, first, it was uh, written in the last century. Uh, it was written for C++, remember? Uh, kind of old language, weirdly. Um, there is only one thing which is important in the design pattern book. It's um, the four words, which say uh, we have only two big principles. The first one is you should program using interface, not implementation. It's obvious for everybody now, but <laughs> at that time it was, let's say, less obvious. You should use list and not array list when you call uh, a public class, when uh, um, uh, a public method. If you have a public method that take um, a list as parameter, it should not be the implementation, but the interface. And the other one, which is in fact more important, is usually still not uh, understood <laughs> by most of the people. You should always favor object composition over class inheritance. It's especially true uh, when you talk about behavior. Um, basically, um, we have class that represent data, and we have class that represent behaviors. Things like factories, like they don't hold any values, they just say how to access to some object. And especially for these kind of um, um, classes, you should always use composition and never use inheritance. As a kind of side note, if you take a look to the patterns in the book, some patterns use inheritance instead of composition, which is a kind of sad thing. Okay. I will, um, let's start the journey. Please take your pill. Um, I, I will uh, uh, flush your mind with that slide. You will see a lot of slide with a lot of code. I'm really sorry. Let's start with just a simple example. Let's start at just one, I want a logger. And I want a, a, really, a really, really simple logger with no uh, kind of uh, warning or level. Um, I don't want 
uh, level, level message. I just want a simple logger. A simple logger is just something which is able to basically print out a message. If I want to implement it, there is a, a simple way to do that. I just defas, uh, define an, an interface logger that takes a string and return void. And if I want a logger that prints your message on system.out, I can r just write a simple lambda that will take the message and print the message. OK for everybody? I can use a lambda to implement my interface. Let's just change a little bit the example. So I have my interface logger, and I want to be able to filter my logs. Exactly what I want is decide, depending on the message, if uh, the message will be logged or not. So I have a new interface called filter that will have a method accept that takes a message and return a boolean. And if the boolean is true, the message will be logged. If the, mesa if the uh, return value is false, the message will be uh, just forgotten. OK, so the question is, I know my design patterns. I want to implement something like this. I want a logger which is able to log message. How to do that? It's one of the first examples of the uh, Gongo Ford design pattern. I can use the template method things. What is the uh, template method ID? The template method ID is you can see on the bottom, I have an abstract method name accept. I will implement my filter logger as an abstract class. It will take a logger as parameter, and this is how I implement log. I say I will delegate to accept. Um, so a uh, class that implements my abstract class will be free to implement accept as they want. Is it something you do? I hope not. I mean, it's really awful. It means that every time I want to uh, uh, chain uh, to uh, uh, accept uh, using a different kind of way to accept things. I have to create a new subclass for each things. This is basically I use inheritance instead of composition. This is something I sh should never, 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 never do. Uh, it, uh, there is a good way. Uh, to um, see the problem. With, uh, if you have something like an abstract class which is public, you're basically dead. Because you don't do composition. If you have an abstract class, you, exp you, d you say, uh, I will create a class to provide that uh, this class will inherit from my abstract class and provide the semantics. Uh, there is a good way to see that this is not the way to design things, which is um, you should have only one responsibility. And if you inherit from an abstract class, a public abstract class, you have two responsibilities. You have the responsibility here of being a logger, and you have the responsibility of how you um, uh, accept message. You should not have a class with two responsibilities. 
only once. How to implement this? It's really easy. You should use composition, which means you should take a logger and a filter as parameter, so you have only one class, which is a filter logger, and because you take a filter as parameter, you can decouple your filter logger and the way you want to filter things, which are two different responsibilities. OK? Let's now transform the code. I mean, this code is really great. It's just we don't need to write uh, so much code for that. Uh, first, you can see that the filter logger doesn't add any methods if you compare to the interface logger. So having a name for this is stupid. You don't need a class, uh, I mean a named class for this. You can use an anonymous class for this. Usually you use an anonymous class if you don't want to provide a name because um, the interface is enough. Here, the, the name filter logger doesn't uh, buy much. You can implement it directly as an anonymous class. Why it's better to implement it as an anonymous class? It means that if you take a look to the, the Java doc, what you will see is just a method and not a class. You will have something like this, which is, I will create a class, something like loggers. You know this kind of class you find in Java that ends with an S. As a, um, usually we call that garbage class, which is <laughs> when you look for something and you don't find, find it in the interface, you just see if there is no s a class that ends with an S, with the same name that the interface, like things like Java Util Collections and things like this. Uh, we'll see how to remove this garbage class after. So Basically, the idea is you can just have one method, filter logger, and implement the logger as an anonymous class. Is it uh, okay for everybody? You don't have to have a name here because the interface is what you want to implement. It's e exactly the same things with an iterator. When you create an iterator, an iterator you, you will not provide a class. You will use an anonymous class. Because when you implement an iterator, you don't add any methods in it. Is it OK? Oh, so there is something special in Java 8. You don't have to put final on local variable if you want to capture them. OK? So you don't need final anymore or any local variable. OK? I want to read code. I don't want to read final everywhere. You, I mean, final on field, it's OK. But don't put final on any local variable. Please. I will have to read your code. Remember that. OK? <laughs> Obviously, logger is an interface with one method. So instead of using an anonymous class, I can implement it using a lambda. So instead of having my new logger something, I will implement it using the arrow, the arrow syntax, something like this. OK? I want to return a logger. A logger is something that takes a message and return void, so I can return a message. I will return a function that take a message and do the filtering. I don't need an anonymous class. Basically, you can see 
uh, a lambda as a kind of anonymous class in the case as of a, I have only, only one method. It's something simple. Um, here, basically, I want to implement a method. I don't want to create a new class. So I can use the syntax of the lambdas for this. And this is how I will call it. Not this is something uh, that starts to be cool. I have a logger, which is defined as an interface. And I will filter my logger by providing a filter. A filter is also an interface with one method. So I can provide, I can use a lambda for it. OK? We call this kind of um, methods, methods like filter logger, we call them higher order function. Um, you, you don't care about the name. Basically, a function that takes a function as parameter is called a higher order function. It's just a funny name. Um, but it's, uh, it's something which is important because basically, um, you do something which is you combine your function to create a new function. Uh, in fact, this is not how we will implement it. We can do better. I mean, it's a kind of ugly. I have to. Oh, so perhaps you have not seen the difference between this and this. Here, I am in a static class called loggers, and here, I'm directly in the interface logger. In Java 8, you can put static methods in interface. You will find it ugly until you will use it. <laughs> Why it's important is just you don't have to crawl the Java doc to find your method. Just a nice place to put things. So yes, it means that you can rewrite your hello world using an interface, because you can put main now in an interface. OK? But it's still something weird. If you take a look to the signature of the method, my filter logger is a static method that takes a logger. That smell. It should be an instance method, not a static method. Let's do that. OK. This is how you can write it. You can put code in interface. You can do that. I, I, I do that. Um, because uh, um, method in interface are abstract by default, you have to say something like, this is not an abstract method. Oh, it's how it works in Java. If you have a class, if you want an abstract method, you have to put abstract in front. If you are in an interface, you don't have to put abstract in front, because by default, all methods are abstract. So if you want a non-abstract method in your interface, you have to put something to say non-abstract. In Java, non-abstract is named default. OK? Default is the dual of abstract. So if I want to implement a method in my interface, I will use a default method. Filters that take a filter and return a logger. And I will implement it as using a lambda. The thing which is nice with this is when I call it, I take my logger, call filter on it, and in return a new logger. For the client point of view, I have my logger, I'll I put dot control space, and I find filter directly on it. 
okay? If you take a look, it, you can see filter as a function composition. So method filter is basically what you do is really something like in, in math, when you do function composition. You have a logger, which is basically a function. You have a filter, the filter object, which is basically a function. And you compose them to create a new logger. It's not the mathematical composition. We can do if and things like that. It's a computer, a computer. it's not a something you run in, in your head. But basically, it's the same idea. Basically, the object composition and the function composition are two sides of the same coin. It's the same principle. OK? Uh, in fact, I have defined an interface filter here, but I don't need it. I don't need it because uh, GDK8 already come with interfaces that already exist. There is already an interface that takes an element and returns a Boolean. This an interface is named predicate. So instead of using filter here, I can use a predicate of string because I know that in Java Util function, I have an interface predicate that takes a T and the method test take a T and return a Boolean. So for the compiler, a predicate of T is just a function type that take a T and return a Boolean. OK? So this is the code you should write if you want to filter a logger. You should use function composition and not an abstract class and a lot of class that inherits from, from a public abstract class. The takeaway, you should never, never, never use an abstract class which is public. You can use, you can use abstract class that are not public if you want to share code, but your abstract class should never never be public. An abstract class is something that you use to share deta uh, implementation detail. It should, not, uh, it should not be something which is visible from the outside. Because if your requirement change, you can't remove this public abstract class anymore if the abstract class is public because it's now part of the hierarchy which is visible from the outside. You should never have an abstract class which is public. Never. Repeat after me. I will never use a public abstract class anymore. OK? OK. So we will use. Um, I don't remember the name of, of this girl. It's Naiobe, or I think, perhaps. She will represent function composition. OK? So let's take a look to the kind of patterns uh, in the, that are defined in the GOF. We have the structural pattern, the creational pattern, and the behavioral pattern. I really like. Um, this picture. No? OK, basically, I'm more interested by the behavioral and the creati creational pattern than the structural one. Just an example of structural patterns and of structural pattern and how to implement it using lambdas. Really, we have already seen some structural patterns because uh, logger.filter is named proxy or decorator. <laughs> is named proxy or decorator uh, already. The logger.filter 
uh, is a decorator or a proxy depending on the book you use uh, to learn design patterns. So let's take another example. <laughs> now I want a real logger. What is a real logger? It's my logger 2, sorry. And the logger 2 take a log level and a message. And I have an enum that defines my level, warning and error. This is how I can implement my logger too. I can use a lambdas, and I will just print the level and the message. My question is how to adapt a logger to as a logger. I want to see my logger to as a logger. A logger is something that just takes a message. A logger too is something that takes a logger level and a message. I should be able to do something here. Just let's take a, a step back. This is something we call partial application. Uh, partial application, the idea is if I have a method that, uh, that takes, by example, two parameters, if I uh, offer a value for one parameter, I will be able to see it as a function that takes only one parameter. Uh, sometimes, um, I don't know if you know uh, what purification is, but purification is a way to do exactly the same thing. Basically, if I have a bin up here that takes two ints, I can see it as a un unary op that takes only one ins, doing things like that. If I have add, which is defined by doing the plus between x and y, I, I can define add one as being a function that has only one parameter and call add with x and one. Okay? can do exactly the same thing with mul. I can reuse exactly the same principle here with my logger. A logger is equivalent to a logger2 with uh, if for a logger2 I provide a level. So if in my logger2, I have a method level that take a level, I will be able to see my logger2 as a logger. Okay, I have a logger2 that take two parameters. If I fix the level, it will be a logger that take only the message. So, a logger. How to implement this? It's really easy. I want to return a logger, so I want to return a function that take a message and call this dot log. I haven't write the this. I should perhaps write it. Okay, here the call to log is equivalent to this dot log, the level and the message. So if I have a logger2 and I will be able to call level with a specific level L, it will return a logger. Okay? This is basically the implementation of the adapter pattern in one line. Okay? It's just partial application. In fact, there is already um, the, the operator colon colon in Java already does partial application. If you take a look to string colon colon length, if you call um, a colon colon 
on a type, you will see it as a function that takes a string and return an int. Twin function is a function that takes a string and return an int. Okay? If I have string colon colon length, I can see it as a function that takes a string and return an int. So it's a function that takes a string and return an int. If I use colon colon directly on a string, I will see it as a function that takes nothing and return an int. An int supplier. Okay? The operator colon colon in Java already do partial application, but only if the method, here the method length, is an instance method. It only works on instance method. Okay? We will use Seraph for partial application. The idea is if you, uh, why you want to uh, partially apply function, the idea is uh, you can uh, decouple things. Uh, basically, you, you, you have case where in your main you already have some values, and uh, if you take a look to these values, perhaps you will only use it far, 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 far from it inside your code. And uh, basically the idea is you, you can, uh, instead of taking your values and passing into all call, what you can do is just um, take a function and specialize, specialize it with the parameter you need. And you will only pass this function. This is uh, uh, um, the, example, the example you see of a partial application. So we have finished with um, as a, um, the simple pattern. We will start with the creational patterns. We will see the static factory, not the factory method. I don't know if you know the factory method, but it has the same problem as a template method. The factory method is an abstract class, basically. We will not see the singleton because it's basically a global, and I don't want to have uh, to debug program with globals. Please don't do that. Technically, we will see how to create a singleton without being a global. We will see the factory kit and the builder. Let's take just a simple example. I have a, a hierarchy of vehicle and I have two implementation, a class car that take a color and a class moto that take a color. And in my program, I want either to create five red cars or five blue motos. Obviously, I can reuse a part of the code, which is to create five who. So I will write it something like this. I will create a factory of vehicle, and I will create a method create five that take a factory of vehicle. So create. F I will be able to reuse the method create file with a red car factory and with a blue moto factory. That's basically the idea. I don't know um, if you have the habit to see code, but basically in s uh, that take a stream, but in stream range 0, 5, just uh, create a stream of values, and for each values it will call factory.create and put all the values in a list. Okay, the real question is how to create a red car factory and a blue moto 
factory. If I take a look to my interface vehicle factory, it's a functional interface with only one method, so I can implement my factories using a lambda, like this. So what is a red car factory? It's just a lambda that takes no parameter and return, in the case of the red car factory, a new car red. Okay? Technically, I don't need the interface, the interface vehicle factory because I have already a, a class named supplier in the GDK that does exactly this. So with a supplier, it's exactly the same code. I will have a supplier of vehicle and the method of the interface supplier is named get, which is not a great name but we will have to live with that. Okay, it's the same code. I don't have to define a new interface. I have already an interface supplier that exists for that. If I take a look to the code, I can factorize the code a little more. Here, I have something that create a new car and put red on it. I can separate it in two parts. I have a first part which is I want to create a car or I want to create a motto. And another part which is say this thing will be red or this thing will be blue. I can use partial application for that, which is define a method named partial that take a function, a value, and return a supplier. My function will be something like new car. We have a fancy syntax for uh, taking a constructor and see it as a function. It's car colon colon new. It's really, really nice syntax. So basically, I have my constructor, I have my value, I use partial to, from a function that take two parameter, return, uh, that take one parameter and return a value, I will create a function that take zero parameter and return the value. And how to implement partial? It's easy, I have to return a supplier. A supplier is something that takes no parameter. It will call the function with the value as parameter, just something like this. Nice, no? It's just partial application. The idea is to say if I want to create a car which is red, I can decompose it. I have the constructor and I have the value. And I will just create from a function and a value something which is a function that takes no parameter and return the result of the call of the constructor with the value. It's just partial application. Basically, all the factories you are writing are just a way to implement partial application. You just re-implement it every time, but it's just partial application. Let's take an example a little more complex. Let's say I have a method create, which take a string and return a vehicle. Depending on the string, if it's a car, we'll return a car. If it's a moto, 
create, create a new moto. And if it's not a car or a moto, I will just throw an exception. Obviously, this code is ugly because I have written in the code all the possible implementation, which means that if I come from with a new implementation, I will have to crawl all the code, try to find all the switch, and replace with a new implementation. Not something I want to do. I have a design pattern for this. It's called abstract factory or factory kit. The idea is just we will have a vehicle factory and two methods, one that register for a name what is the constructor of vehicle that we will use. So we will use it by calling register by saying I register car and the constructor and I register my string moto with the constructor. And I have another method which is create that take a string and return the corresponding vehicle. Basically what create does, using the name it finds the right constructor and just call it. Here my constructor is a supplier how I will implement this? It's basically a hash map, no? So it's a hash map between string and suppliers. Register is just a put, and create is just a get, almost a get, because it can return null and if it's return null, it means there is no name corresponding. So you have to throw an exception. Um, obviously, this pattern is ugly. I have it takes several lines. <laughs> Do you know how to implement it in one line? Oh, there is a trick for that. Um, map. And as a new method in, in Java 8 called uh, get or default. And basically, get or default takes the key and takes a value as a second parameter. And if there is no value for the key, it will return the second parameter. So basically, get is equivalent to get or default key null. So I can use get or default and do something really fun, which is I will call get or default the name, and I will use a lambda because here the value of, my, of uh, the hash map is a supplier of vehicle. So here I will create a lambda that will throw the exception, and then when I call get on it, get is the method of the supplier, it will throw my exception, if the name is not known. Uh, yes? Why is that an ugly pattern? Ah, because in, <laughs> in a switch, uh, you encode all the possibilities. Register. You register all yes, but I can do my register in my main. So, uh, if I want to reuse my code, I can have a new register. Uh, basically, it's a kind of way to implement uh, dependency injection easily. It's basically exactly the same idea. Why it's better? Because my register, I will do it when I do the configuration of my software. And I'm not stupid enough to use annotation for that, but I use code. But basically, the idea is you rewrite your register in your main. So depending on your application, you will have different configuration. And you will share exactly the same code, because in your code, you will use vehicle factory. The problem with the switch is that you are encoding your configuration, the configuration of the, uh, the different 
class that you can find if you in your hierarchy directly in the code. Is it okay? It answer to your question. Okay, everybody. So it's a kind of a nice trick, which is instead of having to manage null, the idea is to return a lambda that will throw an exception after. So I can write it in one link, in one line. Okay. Let's suppose now I have this class which is implemented and I want to implement a single tone. Here, when I register a car, I will create a new car each time I call create. Let's say that now I want only one instance of Moto. The main problem of the uh, singleton uh, design pattern is that it does two things. The first thing is to guarantee that there is only one instance of a class, which is what we want, usually. But we have another thing, which is everybody in your code, everywhere uh, in your code, you can ask for this singleton. It's a global. And usually, we don't want this. We want explicit dependencies and not hidden dependencies. How to do that? It's really, really simple. We can write it like this. You allocate your singleton, and in register, you use a lambda that will return always the same object. That's all. It's all you need. Every time you will call create with a motto as parameter, it will always return the same instance of motto. That's all you need. It's how to implement the Zikulton design pattern without having the global things, the global dependency things. Okay, in fact, I can have m a better code. There is a bug in my API here. I don't see if you, do you see that my API has a bug here? It's an API bug, I mean, it's not in the code or something like this, it's here. The way I want to use it is to call register with all my constructor, and then call create. But I don't want someone to call register after that I've called create. I mean, it will create bugs. So I want to separate the register, the registering step from the creation step. What is the design pattern for that? Want to separate registering from the creation? The builder. This is the, the classical builder. You can see it. <laughs> Sometimes it fails. So basically, the idea is in your builder, you have your name, you have your uh, method register, and you have a method create that will create a factory, and I reuse my vehicle factory here to create the instance. So um, I will first create my builder, register all my constructor, then create a factory and use a factory to create my cars, my motos. Okay? I want to implement it with lambdas.
In fact, in this um, API, I have a, another problem, which is um, I can create a builder. From a builder, I can create a factory. But I can reuse the builder to do something later. That's ugly. I don't want that. I want to force my user to use the builder one time and not be able to reuse it. They just, um, I should not let my user to be able to create a builder. You will do things like storing the builder in a static final field and reuse it, and it will crash my application. I don't want this kind of ugly things. I mean, so I can do things like if you call create, you put a boolean to false, and you can't call register after, or things like this, but it's really ugly. We can come with a better design. The idea is the user should not create the builder. The user should call register on a builder, but should not create the builder. So it's not his object. It's mine. This is how to do that. What is a builder? A builder is just something that do a register and I have a static method in my vehicle factory that take a consumer of builder. What is a consumer of builder? It's a function that take a builder and return void. This is how to use it. You call factory. It will take a builder and the, this builder is not created by the user. It's provided, uh, provided by the implementation of the method factory, and you, the user can only register things on the builder. And at the end, what the user have is only the factory object. Okay, it's the lambda builder pattern. It's not a new pattern. Uh, if you take a look to uh, Ruby, Ruby use it everywhere. It just here, you have type, but it's, it's the same pattern. And this is really, really a nice pattern. If you take a look, the interface builder is a functional interface, and the vehicle factory is a functional interface too. So I can implement this using only lambdas. No class. OK, how to implement the method factory? Here is the code. I really like this kind of code. I will create my hash map. Register is equivalent to doing map.put on it. So map colon colon put is my builder, and I will call consumer.accept with my builder. So at client side, I will receive a builder that will, when I call register, just do a map.put on it. And from the other side, I want to return a, a vehicle factory. What is a vehicle factory? It's a function that takes a string and return a vehicle. So I can implement it like this. I take a name and return something that will go uh, look inside the map, find the supplier, the supplier which is the second parameter of the register, and call get on it. Four lines of code for a builder and factory. 
I can do worst. Basically, my interface builder is already an interface that exists in a Java util function because it's an interface that takes two parameters and return void. Its name is B consumer. So basically, my builder is a B consumer of string and supplier of vehicle, and my vehicle factory is a function that takes a string and a vehicle. So I can reuse a more generic implementation. <laughs> it's just for fun, okay? But I can write my factory kit as just one method. which is something that take a consumer of big consumer and parameterize, so can I can reuse it with a supplier, but with anything, well, just for fun. I have published a slide when you will have uh, 20 minutes with uh, some caffeine and just to read the thing. Okay, so a factory kit is just a map of factories. A builder allows to separate the mutable part and the immutable part of the factory kit. The builder will you will use the builder to register things and you it will create the factory which is after immutable. Okay? We have finished with the, um, the creational pattern. We will go to the behavioral patterns. Just a simple example. Let's say I have a CSV file and I want to sum all the values, of all the line of the file. This is how I can implement it using Java 8. Uh, Files.line, take a pass. I don't know if you know what a pass is. It's something from Java 7. A pass is basically a file, like Java EO file, with not all the problem of Java EO file. I don't Java EO file have two, two problems. The first one is uh, some method when you call them and uh, when they fail, they just return a Boolean, <laughs> not an exception, which is ver something very stupid. And the other problem is uh, the Java EO file try to decode the file you have in your file system in Unicode, even if it doesn't know the chat set, which is something really funny. That's why you have uh, a name with question mark in the... So basically, Java NEO uh, file pass is just the new version of uh, Java IO file. Uh, on files, I have a method lines that will return all the line uh, of the file, but the line are not uh, stored in a list of files or something like this. They are produced and sent one by one. Um, I have a method named flatmap, which does something uh, which is for each line, it will separate the line on, uh, uh, on uh, several tokens. And instead of uh, seeing um, a stream of array of token, I will see it as a stream of token, which means that each token will be uh, uh, seen as concatenated uh, with the previous line and the next line. Uh, basically, it means that I take my file, I separate by line, and for each line, I separate using the comma things. So now I have 
a stream of string, each string being a value of the CSV uh, file. And then for each token, I call double pass double with my token. It will transform it to a double. And at the end, I just sum all the doubles. The thing which is nice here is that uh, the stream API um, doesn't create uh, intermediary representation. It's not something like I will create a list of string and put uh, two gigs of line in my memories and then do each uh, processing. It will be done online. Um, this is not exactly the way to write it. You have a more funny way to write it using method reference. So instead of a token arrow double dot pass double token, we can just say call the method double pass double as a function. And um, directly on the class pattern, the class pattern represents uh, an automata created from uh, an uh, uh, a regular expression. So I create my automata and I have a nice uh, split as stream, which is a, a method that um, for each line we create a new stream. Yeah, I need to use partial application because the split stream is for this special automata. Okay. Now that we have seen uh, some funny Java code, uh, in terms of design pattern, it's, it's, it's not a real great code because this code does two different things. The first one is to transform all the line um, in values, in doubles. And the second part is to sum the double. Um, if w we want to reuse the parser part, by example, we will have to separate the parser part and the part that does the sum. So this is uh, basically the callback or the observer pattern. The idea is I want to have a CSV parser. I will uh, send it a pass and an observer. And for each value, it will call the observer. And in my method pass and sum, I will send a pass with an observer that will just count the double. So I will have two codes cleanly separated, the parser of values in my CSV and the code that just sum all the values. OK, let's suppose that the parser already exists. If the parser exists, this is how to implement the things that will do the sum. You know that you can put class in methods. Yes? It's Java 1.1, come on. You can create a class. And the nice thing is that this class will not be visible outside of the method. Uh, yeah, basically in a lambda, you, you can't do a side effect in it. So if you want to do side effect, you have to create an object that with a field here, sum, I will create my header on it, and I will do my side effect directly on this field. So here, for each value, I will sum this value in my field sum here and just return it after. OK? 
Sometimes you find this code with an array instead of a new class, with an array of with only one uh, one value in it. Because in Java, array are always mutable, but I think this code is uh, a little nicer. Okay, so this is how if the parser already exists, I can use it to do the sum of the value. And now I just have to write the parser. So I have already written it. It's just at the end, instead of calling sum, I will call for each. And for each value, I will call the method data of my observer. So for each values in my CSV file, it will call the observer. Okay? Here there, there is a nice uh, thing which is the method for each is is called on the result on the result of uh, map to double and the map to double uh, return a double stream. It's a stream of double, which is return. And my method for each take a double consumer. A double consumer. It's something. It's a function type that take a double and return void. So for each, take a double consumer, and here I want to call it with an observer, which is something that take a double and return a void. So this is something which is not that nice in Java, which is because we don't have real function type, we use interface for representing function type. It means that we can have several interfaces for the same function type. Here, the function type that take a double and return a void is implemented by two interfaces. The so interface is double consumer. Its real name is Java Util Function Double Consumer. This is the interface which is used by Forage. And here in my code, I have an observer which is another interface which represent exactly the same function type. So the nice things with uh, using functional interface is that um, I don't have a function type in Java. I have interface. So it works with any interfaces that was written before Java 8. But the nasty thing is that I have several interfaces that can represent exactly the same function type. In fact, there is a way to convert from a function type to another function type which represent exactly uh, for a functional interface to another functional interface if it represents exactly the same function type. Here, I have an observer and I want to see it as a double consumer. There is a way to do that, which is to write the lambda here, which is to say I take a value and I will call observer.data on that values. But I have another way to implement it, which is to use the colon colon operator is here. Which is to say, here, basically, I want to call the function data, or the method data of my interface. So I can write it like this. It's basically partial application again. But here I use partial application 
to convert between an observer to a double consumer, and it works because the two interfaces represent exactly the same function type. How it works for the compiler when I, I write observer colon colon data, you take a look to the, uh, uh, to the method, the method take a double and return a void. So for each should be a method that take a double and return a void. And because it's a double consumer, it works. So the colon colon operator on an interface um, allow to convert from a functional interface to another functional interface that have different name but that represent exactly the same function type. That's why you can do the colon colon on an instance in Java. It's to be able to do the conversion easily between uh, functional interface. So basically, the conversion from a functional interface to a functional interface is done by using, uh, is done by doing partial application using an instance uh, method reference. I don't know if you see it. It's Seraph. Seraph is partial application. It represents partial application. Okay. Um, perhaps a, a more uh, interesting example. Let's say I have a, re a hierarchy of expression. Uh, I have an expression and I have three class that implement my expression. My expression can be a value, it can be a variable, or it can be a binary operator. Add or remove, or add or uh, multiply, or things like this are not subclass of an abstract class. Remember, no abstract class anymore, no public abstract class anymore. I will use delegation. My binary op take an operator as parameter, and my operator. Here is just an enum of the value. Okay. Um, I don't know if you understand how the map is initialized. Basically, uh, on an enum, you have a method values. You know the method values of enum? It returns all the different values of the enum. Um, so from an enum, uh, from the values of the enum, I see the values as a stream of value, and I will collect them in a collector which is called to map, which basically creates a new map. And I will provide two functions. The first function is how from a value find the key that will be inserted in the map. The second function is how from a value find the value <laughs> that will be inserted in the map. So for the func function uh, from an operator, I will use the symbol, so plus, minus, or star, and the value will be directly the operator. So basically in my map, I have a string for the string plus, I will have the instance of the operator that I have called add here. It's nice, it's just one line. And I have written a method pass that take a token and try to find it in the map. And if it's not found in the map, Basically, it will return an optional. I don't know if you know optional. 
what optional is in Java 8? Uh, I can use map.get here and return an operator. The problem of map.get is that it can return null. If it returns null, it will crash in the client code. And because my, uh, uh, the, my user are really stupid, <laughs> I don't want uh, to crash their code. So I will use optional here uh, as a way to uh, um, force my user to take care of the, f of the fact that my operator can be there or maybe there is no operator because it's called with something which is not plus, minus, or star. Okay? Let's say now that my method parse here that take an iterator will uh, pass an expression like the one you have plus two star a3, which is an expression which is written in uh, reverse Polish notation. Polish notation. It's plus between uh, the result of two star a and three. So this is how to implement it. Note it's it's a nice function because it's recursive and at the same time, because it uses an iterator, it does side effect. I mean, it's nice to write, it's not right, uh, nice to debug, but it's another problem. So basically, I take the first token, uh, I try to parse it using operator.parse. If the operator is present, I will uh, call new binary up with the result of the passing of the two arguments after. Otherwise, it's perhaps a value, so I try to call double dot pass double. If it works, it was a value. Otherwise, I will get a number format exception and I return a new variable. It's a, it's a way to do the passing. What is the problem here? I have encoded all the different possibilities. I can add, I can't add a new one. It's encoded directly in the code. It's basically exactly the same problem that the switch. The code is a little more complex, but it's exactly the same problem, which is I have encoded all the, the possible subtype of expression. I can't add a new subtype. What is the design pattern to solve that? Ah. You will not be able to go out of this room if you don't answer to that question. It's something that say, I will try this one. Oh, it doesn't work. I will try next one. Oh, it doesn't work. Chain of responsibility, exactly. Thank you. Whew. So, how to implement this? First, we have to extract all the different behavior. We will do pass binary up, pass value, pass variable, each one we return an optional, and then we will just combine the different optional to implement the strategy we want. So, perhaps the simple one, pass variable, pass variable always work, it just return the variable. Pass value, it will try to do a double dot pass value. If it raise an exception, it will return optional dot empty. Otherwise, it will create a value and use optional dot off to wrap it in optional. So the result is either optional empty, 
if it's not a value or optional of of the value of the value object the last one is a little more complex i will use operator don't pass with the token the token should be either plus or minus or star if it's one of these uh, free character in that case it will return an optional uh, of something of the operator uh, if it's not one of these uh, character one of these operator it will return an optional of empty on optional I have a method map and this met method map uh, will call the lambda only if the optional is not empty So if the optional is empty, the optional empty will be returned. Otherwise, it will create the new binary operation. Not that I have uh, something here. Um, my binary operation, uh, before the new, I have to call pass again. The function is recursive. If it's a binary operation, I have to pass the, le the, the left uh, uh, argument and the right argument. Um, if I want to extract the behavior, to put it in a, in a method and combine them after, I have to be able to abstract, to abstract pass with the iterator. The way to abstract it is just to say, Oh, it's just a function that will return an expression. And basically, here, uh, from the point of view of the things that create the binary operator, this function takes no parameter because the iterator is outside of the creation. So I can abstract it using a supplier which is a supplier of expression. And I will call supplier.get twice. And thanks to the fact that in Java, uh, expression are evaluated from left to right. Not like in C. In C, it's not defined. You don't know. But in Java, you know that it's from left to right. So it will work. OK. So my pass binary op is a little more complex because it will take the token and the supplier, which is a way to abstract the fact that it will do a recursive call. OK? I have not finished. Now, if I want to implement pass, uh, in a way that will be uh, reusable basically is to have a pass that take an iterator and take a function which for the token will return an optional of expression. If I use that, I will be able to say I want call pass with my iterator and one of these method any one of these methods. If I take a look to these method, they always take a token and return an optional expression. Oh, exactly, there is a little problem with parse binary because it takes the supplier to do the recursive part, but we will do a, a partial application for that. So this is just uh, my method pass, my method pass take the iterator and just use the factory. Because the factory return an optional, I can use or else throw, which basically means if the function return an optional which is empty, it will throw an exception. It means that I have not uh, find a way to pass uh, this expression. OK, so this code can be uh, reuse 
And in my main, I will do the chain of responsibility things. The idea is, if I do it in my main, I can change. If I want uh, a new way to pass an expression, I can just add it. It's not encoded somewhere in my software deep enough that I don't want to touch it. It's just done directly in the main. So in my main, I will call a method create. The method create takes the iterator and do the chain of responsibility things, which is basically called pass with a function. And what my function does is to call pass binary up if it returns an optional which store a value, it will be enough. Otherwise, it will call pass value if um, pass value fail, it will return an optional of empty, and it will call pass variable, which in this case always succeed. This is the way to encode the chain of responsibility, which is a nice way to encode it. Um, I have lied a little because OR is a method of Java 9, not Java 8. It was forgotten. It's, it's a nice thing uh, of being known from the guys from Oracle. You can ask to have something and have it. So this is uh, um, how this is implemented. You can note how the recursive things is done. When you call pass binary up with the token, you send the lambda that will do as a recursive call corresponding to the thing. Here, lambdas are not really used to implement something. They are used to delay calculation which is my method or here will take a lambda, which is something important, because if it doesn't take a lambda, it will evaluate pass value. The idea is here, my method or take a lambda and will evaluate the lambda only if the result of pass binary is optional.empty. I need to use the lambda as a way to delay the calculation and only do the calculation if something. Okay? Lambda is allowed to delay computation. It's Morpheus. Do you want to pause now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's say 20 minute pause, perhaps a little 15, let's say 15, 15. Okay, welcome back. It seems there are less people. No? Well, I keep coming. So let's see another uh, design pattern. So state design pattern. Ah. It's uh, so example use another logger. Um, I have a logger which have two different configuration. I have the chatty logger, and I have the quiet logger. Basically. Um, the idea of the uh, state desired pattern is that instead of having one object that change its own uh, field, you have different objects that represent the different state of your uh, uh, of your application. So here I have uh, the chatty uh, logger. The chatty logger is able. Um, to log using 
uh, a method error or using a method warning. The quiet logger have exactly the same interface. You have a method error, you have a method warning, but the method warning do nothing. That's why it's a quiet logger and not a chatty logger. Um, from a chatty logger, so I can call two methods. I can call chatty that will return itself, and I can call quiet that will return the quiet logger. So from a logger, I'm able to change its state either by calling quiet or by calling chatty. And for uh, my uh, implementation, I will use a consumer of string. Basically, a logger is just a consumer of string. Um, obviously, even if chatty and quiet are two different classes, I have a common interface, so I can implement uh, my state pattern by seeing I have an interface logger and two classes, chatty logger and quiet logger. In my logger, uh, my uh, interface, so I have the method error and warning, I have the method quiet and chatty, and um, by default, I have a static method in my interface, and if I ask for a logger by providing a consumer of string, it will return me, by default, the chatty logger. So it works that way. Uh, from the interface logger, I can call logger with a consumer of string. You remember the colon colon and system dot out. It will return a logger. By default, it's the ch chatty logger. So if I write warning, it will print a warning on system dot out. From this logger, I can call quiet. It will return a new quiet logger, and if I call warning on this quiet logger, it should do nothing. Okay, it's the quiet logger. Um, this is the way to implement it um, in the Gong of Four book way. You have two classes, one which is the chatty logger, one which is the quiet logger. They all take a consumer as parameter. Uh, you can see the difference between, in, in warning of the quiet logger, you just do nothing. And if you call quiet, you will create a new quiet logger. If you call chatty, you will create a new chatty logger. And if you call quiet on the quiet logger, it just return this. Exactly the same thing for the chatty logger. The main, there are several issues. One issue is you create a new logger each time you change your state, which is not exactly here. When I call chatty and quiet, I have only two loggers, two instances. I don't want to create a new one each time. And basically, I have used uh, inheritance instead of composition here. Let's implement it uh, using lambdas. And you will see something which is really, oh, oh I find it fine, fun. Okay, so basically the way um, to implement it, if you want to, uh, instead of using inheritance to implement, uh, uh, to implement uh, error and warning, the idea is to take two consumers as parameter. You have the consumer if there is an error. You have the consumer if there is a warning. So you create just only one class and take the two consumer as parameter. The other thing you need to do is uh, when you call quiet, 
either you have to return this or you have to return uh, a new uh, logger. And basically, when you create your logger, you just do a new logger because this is a chatty logger. I send the same consumer twice. The consumer taken his parameter. And here I have a small problem, which is I have uh, two instances, and I want to have A that knows B and B that knows A. Basically, uh, circular initialization. I can, uh, if I'm able to resolve this problem, uh, I will have, um, I will be able to uh, to implement it. Which is, if I have a class A with a field B and a class B with a field A, I want to be initialize this uh, each one. Um, perhaps it's not clear, but I want A and B to be final. I want all my object to be immutable. I mean, not all my object of all my program, but all the, the objects that represent behavior should be uh, not mutable. So I have uh, a little problem of uh, circular dependency. How I solve this? There is two ways to solve it. One way to is to use a, a, a library that does uh, dependency injection and pray. Usually they create a proxy if it works. Uh, what is the other way? <laughs> Nobody knows how to solve that? Really? Come on. There is a trick. When you are inside a constructor, you know this, and you, have not, you are not fully initialized. So basically, the idea is, inside the constructor, you can call the other constructor and sending your reference. Um, the nice way to implement that is to use a lambda for one parameter from the other. Uh, let's say for A, you take a function that take an A and a B. And basically, when you call the function, when you uh, the method is apply, when you call the function, you when you will send your reference. So when you call new A at the bottom, you use a lambda that takes A as parameter and that will create B with A as parameter. It's, it's an ugly trick <laughs> used sometimes. Basically, if you are inside the constructor, when I call my function apply, I'm inside the constructor. When I'm inside the constructor, I have access to this, even if this is not fully initialized. Obviously, if you have thread, you're dead, but I have no thread here, I hope. Um, so I can, imp I can uh, uh, use it uh, a lambda here. I have seen, uh, we have seen that I can use a method reference, create new way with B colon colon new. It's exactly the same, uh, same ID. Now that I know that, I'm able to implement my state pattern. It means that when I create my logger, I need to take two functions. One function that will create the quiet factory and one function that will create the chatty factory. Each one take a logger and produce another logger. It will send this and create the new logger. So I will be able to cross a thing like this. 
and inside the constructor, I will initialize quiet and chatty. Note that quiet and chatty are final field here by sending this for the two things. So in my static method, I will create the chatty logger that take a two consumer, and then I need to pass the quiet factory and the chatty factory. My quiet factory create a new logger and will be called with the chatty as parameter because um, it the quiet factory is called with this here. So the second new create the quiet factory. I send the consumer. The second parameter is a lambda that takes the message and do nothing. So the warning will not be uh, outputted. Uh, for the um, for the quiet factory, which is taken as the first parameter, because I'm the quiet logger, I need to return this. Uh, there is a function named uh, identity in uh, JavaTil function function. Identity is basically a lambda that take x and re return x. Take x and return x. And in case of the um, of the chatty factory, I will take uh, one parameter and send the chatty factory, the, the uh, chatty logger, which is taken as parameter. So basically, I, I take all and link them like this, and that's all. Fun code to write, perhaps not to debug. Well, perhaps my example is not that nice, but basically, because lambdas allow to delay uh, computation, it can be used to solve the circula uh, circular initialization problem. Delay computation. Another example. We will see a, a special design pattern which is not in the Gogov uh, uh, 4 book, but which is important because nobody is able to explain it uh, in a simple way. Which is, let's say I have a user that comes from somewhere and I want to validate that my user uh, is correct. It's basically, I use a framework that takes some uh, uh, parameter that come from the, uh, uh, a UI, by example, or something like this. And um, I want to validate that the name of the user is not null or is not empty. And I want to validate that the age is between something like 0 and 50. I can write this kind of code. It's not that great. Um, th there's basically two problems. But basic what I want is something that say, I, I want to take my user and say, validate uh, that user.getName is not null, or validate that user.getName is not empty, or validate that user.getAge is in between things and things. I want something like a builder, and I want to be able to just call dot .validate, dot .validate, dot .validate, and so on. But it's not that easy, because if I want to be able uh, to chain call, I have a problem here because when I, um, when I, when I have an if like this, basically I have two output, which is either the user is validated or I have an exception. So I have something like this, which is 
I have a user as an input. I want to validate it with some parameter, like the name should be not null or something like this. But the result is either a user or an exception. So I w will not be able to chain my call. Because if I want to chain my call, the input and the output should be the same. It's basically when what you have when you have a builder. You chain your code, and when you chain things, it returns the same, uh, an object from the same type. It can be the same object, or it can be an object from the same type. So I need something that is able to represent either a user or an exception. What is the design pattern for that? What is the design pattern to represent either something or another thing? Or it can be either something or something or something or on. You can have more than two states. Ah. The monad design pattern. The basic idea of a monad is I want to represent different state as a unified value. What I want is to be able to change validation on either a user or an, exce on a, or, or an exception. And when I change, when I chain, sorry, my call to validate, I want that at each time I have either a user or an exception. For that, I need two more operations. I need something at the start that's from a user, return a user or an exception. And I need something at the end which is able to say it will be a user or crash. OK? So if I want to implement my monad design pattern, I will have something like this. I have a validator of T, and I have three operations. I have off, which is able from a T to create a validator of T. I have a method validate. Yeah, let's say this is Vig's signature. We will see how to have a better one, but basically, it takes a predicate and a message. The predicate is something that will check the T and return a Boolean to say if it's OK or not. Validation. I have a string just because uh, it's better for a user to have a nice error message. And so if I do that, I'm able to chain my call. Uh, on valido uh, validator, I will just uh, call off, then chain my validation, and at the end, call get. With this API, I can have several implementations. I can have one implementation that the first time you have an exception, the other validation will not be done. You will call validate but the code will do nothing. And at the end, just return the exception. It will be exactly the same semantics as the if-else we have. A when we throw, it will go out. But we can have another semantics with exactly the same API, which is, I would to register all exception. So the message I will report to the user will contains all the validation problem at once. It will be better for the user to have all the problem and not to have to fix them one by one. OK, so let's see my first implementation. The first implementation will stop to validate something if there is an exception. How to implement that? Um, there is a simple way. There is no or in, uh, in Java. We can't say T or something. So a nice trick is to just use two fields. 
one that store as a the user in your ca in uh, our case or the exception and the semantics you can see it at the bottom if the exception is null it means that it passed the validation otherwise it will just throw the exception I mean it's it, it's a kind of sad way to represent something that have several state I mean so, so Java type system is not able to have a, a pipe between type. Yeah. And how to validate? Um, I will only validate if there is no error. I want to keep the semantics that if there is an exception, I will not try to do any other validation. Uh, otherwise, I will call the predicate to do the validation, and if it returns false, I will create a new validator with an error message, with an exception that store the error message. Okay? But if I take a look to my API, my API is not that great. You can see that I mix two things. Yeah, I do two things that I I should have done separately. The first one is I want to validate the name or the age. It's one thing. And the other is how to validate this field. It should be two different things. I should have something like this. I will code validate with user colon colon get name or user colon colon get age as first parameter, which is which value I want to check, and the other is how I want to check it. By example, I want the value to be non-null, or I want the value to be not empty, or I want to have the age between 0 and 50. Okay? To separate. Um, the last one is not that great. First, it's, it's unreadable because you have uh, the arrow and the. But okay, it's it's the Java syntax. The only the, the 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 issue is more that when you do validate, you should have something which is validate user uh, colon colon get age in between zero and fifty or something like this. You don't want to read something it's a nice c and java lambda mixed but it should be better if we have something like this which is in between with a start and an, an end we we'll return a predicate of integer and we'll just validate by calling in between 0 and 50 so nice things about doing that is, um, you will be able to share way to validate things in your code. Because basically, you just here say something, which is, if it's an int, I know how to now validate it with uh, two bound. Here, in between, is just a higher order function that will return the predicate, make it uh, more readable. So it's a way to, uh, instead of having a lambda with no name, to provide a name to an operation by just returning the lambda. OK? So. Now I have two ways to validate. I have the old way to validate, which take a predicate and a string, and I have the new way to validate that take a function from t to u. For get name, it will be from user to string. For get age, it will be from user to integer, which is the projection. And the predicate 
check the return value of the function. It will check the return value of get name, by example. I can implement the validation by calling the method I have already implemented. That way, which is to say, I will call validate with a predicate. The predicate will take my t, call the, fun the projection function, and on the result of the projection, the projection function, call the validation function. It's a kind of function composition. And we already have in uh, Java Util function function two methods named compose and and then that does the function composition. Uh, note that the function composition in Java is not the mathematical one. When you do uh, F round G, it's in the opposite. Um, that's, that's not a big deal, but here I have a problem. I can't use this compose method or the and then method. I can't use it because it takes a function and return a function. Here, here I want to do the composition between a function and a predicate. A predicate is not a function. Not that nice, but we have seen that we can take a functional interface and see it as another functional interface, but by doing a colon colon on an instance. So this can be written like this. I will call the projection function, and then do the validation. But because the validation is a predicate, I have to transform my predicate to a function. The way to transform a predicate to a function it is to call the method test, which is the method of a, of a predicate, on the predicate using colon colon. It's exactly the same thing that with the double consumer. And the result is a function. The result of the composition of two functions is a function. And here, in validate, the validate of the top, I want a predicate. So I can do the opposite operation, which is from a function, please give me a predicate by calling colon colon apply. And it. Fun? No? Um, the thing is, here we, um, instead of thinking in terms of value, we are thinking in terms of function. We are doing operation on function instead of doing a operation directly on value, so on values. Okay, um, here is a code if I want to gather uh, errors, which is have exactly uh, have another implementation of my validator that will just um, gather all exception um, I have. Uh, how it works? Basically, instead of storing one exception, I will store an array list of exception. When I want to validate something, I will try to call every validation. And if it doesn't validate, it will add a new exception in the array list of things. And in that case, when I call get, if my array list is empty, it means that it passes the validation. Otherwise, I have to return all exception. I can't return all exception. 
So I will create a new exception and add all of them a uh, suppress exception. I don't know if you know what a suppress exception is. Yes, please say yes. <laughs> no, you don't use uh, try parentheses, the try with resources. The, the problem is, um, um, sometimes you have an exception which is raised because of another uh, exception. Uh, in that case, you can use the cause, uh, which is a parameter, of the, which is a, a way to uh, um, tunnel exception in exception. But sometimes it's something which is um, you have an exception and there is another exception, and you want to um, um, throw the first exception and just acknowledge that there is a second exception. You have that in when you do uh, I.O., which is, uh, by example, you have your write that um, uh, throw an exception, and because you can, uh, you can call close in the finale, if close raise an, a new exception, you want the I.O. exception raised by the write and not the one from the close. In that case, uh, you can use suppress exception. Um, and on a list, I have a for each that will call at suppress for each element. Okay. Obviously, a monad is represented by Trinity because it's a way to represent several states as a unified value. That's basically what a monad is. A monad is just a way to represent several states as just one value. And why it's interesting to do that? It's because you can do composition. Once you have represented all your states have, are only one value, you can chain your call. Okay? The visitor pattern. So the idea of the visitor pattern is I have a hierarchy and this hierarchy is closed, which means someone else develop this hierarchy and he don't want me to add new class in that hierarchy, but allow me to implement operation on that hierarchy. Now this is the design pattern of the of the uh, Gong of Four. Technically, um, we want the Graal, and the Graal is to be able to either add new subtype or add new operation. Um, you can see the visitor uh, as a as a, as a way to compare. Uh, functional programming and uh, um, or uh, object oriented programming in object oriented programming uh, you let user to add subtype the the way you extend things is by adding new um, uh, new representation in f in a functional programming what you do uh, is more to say, uh, I have a s uh, I have only um, uh, a, a vehicle can be either a car or a moto, but I will not let my user to add um, a new subtype or a new type for this thing. But I will, uh, if this uh, hierarchy is closed, I will let uh, my user to define any operation of this, because I will do pattern matching on it. If my hierarchy is closed, I can do pattern matching on it. What we want, what the Graal is, is to be able to do both. To be able to add a new operation and to add new subtype. 
um, the, the name of this problem, being able to do both, is called the expression problem. Uh, it was called uh, like this by uh, uh, Philip Wadler. And it's, it's a great way to categorize language by seeing how they try to resolve that problem. So let's uh, take a look to the way the visitor pattern try to solve the expression problem. In the visitor pattern, for each implementation, you will have to implement a method called accept, which means that if your hierarchy is not uh, um, uh, uh, doesn't have this accept method, you will not be able to use it. Uh, you, you will not be able to add new operation on it. Um, the idea is to have a class here that implement an interface and to have a visit car, or visit moto, or visit something. Not that the, the design pattern use overloading between the thing. You can have one visit method that take a car, a moto, and something. But it's exactly the same if you have different name. And it's uh, the, the problem. I do. So this, um, you have to implement all the visits in your visitor. Um, because the, the visitor is an interface, you can't add new visit method. So basically, the visit method, uh, the visitor, uh, close your, the hierarchy. It doesn't close it in. I mean, you can create your own implementation of vehicle if you want, but you will not be part of the visitor pattern uh, because uh, for the uh, for the Goth, the the visitor pattern lists all the visit inside the visitor. And so uh, the idea is to do a kind of double dispatch. This is the uh, old name of the visitor pattern. Uh, you can uh, trace the history of the visitor pattern. I think uh, um, there is a paper in 86 about this implementation, which is basically um, if you have a vehicle, you can't call the method visit uh, directly, so you have to ask your the hierarchy to call the visitor for you. So you have to call accept that will call either visit car or visit moto. Yeah, that's why it's called the double dispatch things. So this is one implementation. As I said, it's not a good implementation because you can't use you can't add new subtype, and I want to add new subtype. So I need a new API. I want a visitor, and I want to be able to register things like this. Let's say, if I see a car, you should execute this lambda. If you see a moto, you should execute this lambda. So I will be able to add new subtype when I want. Then when I have a vehicle, I will call accept with that vehicle. OK? This is the API I want. First, what is the signature of the method when and the method accept? Uh, the method accept is, let's say, simple. Um, so first, my visitor is parameterized by the return type uh, of the accept method, which means that here my s it's a visitor of string. It will return a string. Accept here, I don't know if you see it, but it can be object, because it can be any class, any subtype, it can be object. The, the uh, common supertype of car, moto, and so on 
can be object. In that way, I will be able to re reuse my visitor pattern, even if there are no interface between two classes. The real problem is the signature of the when method. The first parameter is a class. The second parameter is a function. So I will use Java util function function as um, as type. Uh, the first parameter is something fun because you, you want the first parameter to be of the type of the class. Uh, so you want the first parameter of the function to be of the type of the class of the first parameter of when. Which means when I say when car, the first parameter of the function should be a car. If I say when moto, I want the first parameter of the function to be moto. So uh, I have to say the type of the first parameter of when is the type of the first parameter of the function should be related or should be the same. The, the written type of a function should be a string. Okay? So here is how you can uh, type it. You need a T and say the class of T and the function of T should be the same T. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a T on the method, not on the class, because for each call to when, it's a new T. For the first call to when, T will be a car. For the second call to when, T will be a motto. Not that I want to be able to chain my when, so the return type of when is a visitor of air. Basically, in the implementation, and we do return this, like the string builder. Okay? Everybody is okay? Yes? Too many generics? Okay, how to implement it? Basically, I associate to a class a function. How we do association in Java? Hash map. I want a hash map between a class and a function. I have just a little problem. Um, the hash map here, um, if you take a look to, to when, I have the T, which is for each call to when, I will create a new T. But when I type the hash map, I can't use T. Technically, I have no way to parameterize a field in Java. There are some languages that are able to parameterize fields. It's, it's what we call exhaust ex existential type, but there is no such thing in Java, which means that instead of a class of T, we have to store a class of question mark, and the function if you take a look, the way we call it, we call it, uh, we apply, apply take a receiver, which is an object, and return an air. So the function should be object air. The main issue is that it doesn't compile. It doesn't compile because here the type is of class of T, a class of T is a class of question mark, it's okay for the first parameter, but for the second one, I have a function of t, and I try to put it in a function of object, and it doesn't work. How I can solve this? I can try to put a question mark. It, it works for class, it may work for a function. If I put a question mark here, yes, put works, ha! 
but not apply. Why it doesn't work? Because it's a function of something that the compiler should not know. It's basically what you say when you put a question mark. You say, compiler, you're too stupid to understand what I'm doing. It's, it's a type you should not know. So because it's a type not known by the compiler, the compiler will say you can't send a receiver in it because it's a type I don't know. Because it's a type I don't know, I will not let you put anything but null in it. Ah, doesn't compile. Technically, this code is better. I really want a function of object air. The idea is I should change uh, the map.put for uh, for uh, um, sending a function of object air. Like, like usual in computer science, when you have a problem, you can solve this problem with a level of indirection. Let's do that. Map.put will take a function of object air. So the first parameter, object, is type object. And I will call f.apply. And here, I will say, oh, compiler, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Please trust me. I will cast to T. And you will not complain. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> trust me. So it works, but, oh man, we don't need that. Here we have class of T. So we have the real class. So we can ask the class, Please do the cast. Type dot cast. No suppress warning. Everything is cool. It's not that cool. It can crash at runtime, but it's another problem. At least no compile error. Oh, it's a function composition here. You can see it? I compose f and type dot cast. So instead of thinking of values, I can think in terms of function. In terms of function, it's just a composition of function. So I can write it like this, f dot compose type dot dot cast. Okay? And it works. Do I solve the expression problem? Not really, because I have replaced a compile problem with a runtime problem. My cast can fail at runtime. But it's fun. OK. If you haven't followed the whole presentation, we will stop here. First, uh, functional uh, interface is it's a kind of uh, double sword thing. It's really something bad because we don't have function type, real function type in Java. You can't say int arrow int in Java. You have to create an interface for it or you have to know all the interface that are defined in Java util function, in the package Java util function. But at the same time, it's a blessing because we represent function, I mean, fun uh, values that are function are as an interface. And because it's an interface, we can put method in it. So we can have methods that work on function. We can have method like compose that will work on function. So we can define 
semantics just by um, doing operation on function instead of doing operation directly on value. It's a way to bridge uh, OOP and FP. Because we have function, but because we are representing function using interface, it's now an interface and we can call method on it. We have seen that we can use several uh, function, uh, um, sorry, functional programming techniques. We can use higher order function, basically function that take function or return function, like in between. We have seen that we can do function composition. We can use partial application. One really, really nice thing about that is uh, UML class uh, diagram is dead. As you have seen, there is no implementation of those interfaces that are visible. When you create a lambda that implements an interface, it's not visible in a UML class diagram. What you should have in your diagram is just interface. That's all, no class, just interface. And the implementation use lambdas, and you're pure. It's a real, real problem. How we can represent lambdas in UML class diagram? Y you want a way to explain, hey, this implementation is implemented by this lambda here. Y you want your code to be able to be maintained by not you, but someone else. I, don't, I, I haven't the answer of that question. It's a really good question. Uh, I mean, uh, all design patterns I have shown are design patterns that uh, define behaviors. The idea is not to use lambdas to implement POJO or things like this. POJO will still be POJO. It's just if you have code that represent behavior, that represent things like factories or things like that, it should be lambdas. There is no point to using something else. And please, 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 don't use public abstract class anymore. Use composition. Stop to try to create a hierarchy and then try to figure out how to map your problem to your hierarchy. Thank you. Now you know. Question. Yes, no, no question. Your mind blew up. No? Okay.